Buildings are literally the worst thing that humans do to the planet. Nothing consumes more energy, nothing consumes more materials, nothing consumes more drinking water, and human beings spend up to 90% of their time indoors. So if they're getting sick from their environment, in fact they're getting sick from their indoor environment, not their outdoor environment. On some level, even though the green building movement is almost 20 years old, it's like we're still in kindergarten. Uh, I think one of the things that's been so interesting is that we still don't know a lot of what we don't know. And that's because as we've become much more sophisticated, we've learned about all of the challenges that we still face. So I think what started out as sort of a naive, largely technical approach to solving problems in the built environment now we understand that markets and incentives and more business type issues are very paramount to successfully delivering a green product to the market. Clearly LEED has got a, a lot of market cachet for uh, buildings and, and while LEED does not certify products, obviously having products in LEED buildings is, is, is a good uh, incentive. I think as much as anything, uh, people are beginning to think about a legacy and leaving behind something greater than themselves. And so I think uh, the ability to say that I am doing something uh, for the good of the planet, for the good of the community, is, is going to be a significant driver. That it's, it's if, if uh, up to this point it's been sort of the me decades, I think we're thinking in, in larger terms of thinking about the larger community and sort of uh, ourselves as humans, as a species, as opposed to you know, business person, uh, government person, etc. And the other thing I think is that's going to be significantly driving this uh, is the uh, increase in resource costs. So energy is uh, going through the roof, water is going to be uh, supremely expensive. As we begin understanding the full price tag of toxins in the environment, the price tag for removing those toxins either from our bodies or from the environment is going to be realized and the fact that a product does not have toxins that are being put into the environment, that's going to also convey significant value uh, both from a legacy perspective but also from an economic perspective. It's sort of like, you know, every, every river, every ocean begins with uh, a drop of rain. And so it's, it's the little actions. It's, walking out of the room and turning off the lights. It's opting to walk to the corner store instead of driving. It's asking yourself, do I really need to do this? Because at the end of the day, as great as all the material and technical advances are, it's probably not going to be enough to get us to where we need to be to fully live in harmony with the planet, particularly with our population at its current levels. So we're going to have to uh, cultivate uh, desires that are not quite um, as high as they used to be. So if we cultivate, if we cultivate simple desires, then we'll, we'll be wealthy even if we have fewer things. And I think behavior is going to be a big issue and it's, it's, it's our reaction to the crisis uh, that's going to make a, a huge difference. Um, just a personal story was I grew up in Marin County uh, during the uh, very severe droughts of 75 and 76, they had to pump in water, and they, we were on 30 gallons a day, okay? And that is just bare, bare, uh, bare bones, but <clears throat> what the Marin Municipal Water District did that was so brilliant was they allowed us to bank the savings. So instead of going to parties where people were talking about their latest raise or their Porsche or their big house, everybody was talking about how big their their water budget was. And so saving and having a big leftover water budget became the, uh, you know, the bragging rights. And so uh, I think the ability to uh, quantify and reduce our environmental footprint, I think that will be the kind of bragging rights in the future where we're saying, I am living more lightly on the planet than anyone else or as, as lightly as I can and that's going to be a source of pride uh, down the road. So that, I think that'll be a good development. I think we, we spend a lot of time talking about doing well while doing good. That's sort of a mantra these days. But I think what a company like Serious Materials shows is that you can actually do better by doing good. And doing well is, is good, but in order to succeed uh, in a competitive marketplace you in fact have to do better. 
And so what we see are products that not only perform better economically, but they perform better environmentally, and they provide a better service. So with, with those three uh, aces in the hole, if you will, uh, the products coming out of serious materials, I think, are going to really change the landscape in, in a lot of different areas. The thing that I find very intriguing about serious materials is uh, the materials, obviously, but really what, what it is is more the approach, the, the way of thinking differently. And honestly, this, this transcends any particular material that could come out because it's, it's that way of thinking that's almost the um, infinitely renewable resource. And that's really what it's going to take. It's, it's, it's reimagining materials, reimagining services in the built environment that's going to be the leadership play moving forward. So, uh, serious materials is far more than the sum of its parts. It's, it's, the, it's, it's, it's the creativity, it's the way of thinking that's really going to make this company, uh, I think, a model for the 21st century.